Well, I want to thank you for joining me today for the very first Bible study of 2022. We invite God in prayer to be amongst us today. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the many blessings that you give us. We know you're present with us, even without our requests, without our prayer, because you love us, you adore us. But we do ask that you would open up our hearts to what you would want to speak to us on this Epiphany celebration. For he asks us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you notice again, our theme for today is Epiphany. And last week, January the 6th, as it is every single year, is the day of Epiphany, regardless of what day that might fall upon. And we read this lesson, Matthew chapter 2. Let's take a look at this chapter, shall we, together? And we're going to consider what it is, is the epiphany. But before we get to that, what in the world is an epiphany? Simplest way I can put this, an epiphany is an aha moment, a revelation of sorts, right? Something I know now that I didn't know just minutes ago. Oh my goodness, I was 50 plus years of age when I first learned this. Well, I'll tell you what I was 50 plus years of age when I first learned that there is a brand new way of doing academic writing. I've been doing a lot of academic writing as I'm working on my degree and so forth. It's been a long time since I've been in school. And there was something back in my day, we actually used to type our papers with a thing called a typewriter. Look it up, you can Google it if you don't know what it is. All right, a typewriter, by the way, isn't self-correcting. You can't go back and backspace and erase what you just did. It was a, a, a big uh, desktop thing about this size that you would type with. And, you know, once you made a mistake, you made a mistake. You get this little white out and white it out. Maybe go back if you could correct it. But one of the things that we always learned, and uh, back in the day when I learned how to type, was if you had the end of a sentence you'd put a period. So this is my last word. Hit is the last word of my sentence. And I'm going to put me as the first word of the next sentence. What would you always do at the end of the sentence if you learned how to type back in my day? You'd double space, space, space. Oh, I'm told that nowadays this is a no-no. You don't double space anymore. You single space between the period and the next word. Okay, single space. And it's all because of how computers work and again how uh, it used to work with a typewriter. There was a certain space dedicated uh, to each character in a typewriter compared to today. It's auto-correcting and so forth. So they only want you to put one space. It is a tough discipline to relearn everything that you did before. It's that aha moment. Oh, so this is how academic writing is done today. I've had to relearn some things, okay? Well, this is what we hope to do in the season of Epiphany. I hope that you will relearn some things that you think you know about your faith. But before we get to those aha moments, we're going to read the lesson from the book of Matthew, chapter 2. And uh, first of all, I'll point out uh, some points of trivia and then figure out what the aha moment is. That's what you should be asking during the season of, uh, of Epiphany. What is it that God wants to teach me that's, aha, I didn't know that before. I hadn't thought of it that way before. How is this supposed to transform the way I think about life? And so let's look at Matthew chapter 2. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Okay, now remember, Jesus was in Bethlehem. They came to Jerusalem, which wasn't that far away from Bethlehem, by the way. But they were asking the following. Verse 2. Where is this child who has been born king of the Jews? For we have observed his star at the rising. Now, um, these wise men, let's, before we go on with this, who in the world were these wise guys? Okay? Wise men. Um, whatever. So, who are these guys? Um, we believe that these people were Persians, advisors to the kings. Why do we know this? We know for a fact, back in the time of Jesus, there were people called wise men, okay, who would travel from country to country offering their advice or a fee, of course, <laughs> uh, to kings who were in a quandary 
about what they ought to do and they would read the stars and they'd read the tea leaves. Well, of course, that's not uh, this type of uh, wise guys, but they would read the stars. Okay, they would try to tell you what you're supposed to do based upon the location of the stars. So they're always looking at the stars. Who were these people again? We know that they were Persians. Now remember, Persia, back in the day, I'm talking about, you know, uh, 600, 500 years before Christ, Persia was the big bully on the block. They were the big superpower of the day. They were beating everybody until they ran into a buzzsaw called the Greeks. Maybe you've heard of this back in the day of the, or if you've seen the movie The 300, which <clears throat> not exactly very realistic, but it is true. There were a group of 300 Spartans along with literally thousands of other people. We only limited to 300 Spartans, but there were literally thousands of other people supporting the Spartans at this point, who again uh, were trying to attack Greece and their pro pro the progress of the Persians was slowed down by these 300 Spartans. So it's an interesting story. And of course, there was another battle on the ocean as well, too, where the Persians suffered a tremendous defeat, even though they had a much more massive uh, military and, and, and navy and so forth. So it was truly a turning point in the power of the region from Persia to the Greeks. Now, Westerners kind of celebrate that with the Greeks, and we think, oh, isn't that fantastic? Well, you know what? The Jews, the Persians were the good guys, okay? The Greeks were the bad guys. The Persians were the good guys in the Bible. But, um, and they're always the good guys in the Bible because they were the ones who delivered the Israelites from their oppression at the hands of the Babylonians. The Persians defeated the Babylonians, returned the Jews to Israel, and because of that, they were able to flourish once again until, guess who? The Greeks. So if you're a Jew, the Greeks were the bad guys. The Persians were the good guys. That's who these people were. They were the wise men. So after Persia was defeated, many of the advisors to the Persian kings, again, started going on a circuit and traveling around selling themselves. At least their advice, I should say. So these wise guys, that's who they were. So um, they were probably from Persia. Where's Persia today? Persia is modern day, ooh, wait for it, Iran. So they were Iranians, at least what we would call them contemporary culture. Although, let's be careful, not all Iranians are Persians, and not all Persians are from Iran. Although, again, Iran is, was, at least historically, the home of the Persians. Okay, so let's go on. So they were coming to, to, to seek out this king, this Jesus, or whatever his name was. They weren't sure. So where is this child, king of the Jews? We've observed his star at its rising. What star? Huh. So we are told about this great star that was shining, shining over Bethlehem. And they were trying to follow it to find out who it was that it indicated something significant. Remember, I told you they would read the stars and the star showed something. We know that back around 4 BC, there were several of our planets that aligned together as one and made a very brilliant, bright, shining, what looked like or would have been appeared to be a star at that time, what they would have called a star. Um, it only happens every thousands of years. I don't know because I haven't done the research, so please don't quote me on this. I don't know, but I do know that this kind of came together at this time. This possibly might have been the star. And you're saying, wait a minute. 4 BC. I thought Jesus was born in, uh, on December 25th, uh, the first year of our Lord. No, that's actually not true. This is the Gregorian calendar that we're on that it now says that it's 2022. And we know one thing about the Gregorian calendar. So again, according to the Gregorian calendar, we date back the birth of Jesus Christ 2,022 years ago. We know for a fact that this is wrong. We know it's wrong because of one of the historical characters that we're going to mention in just a moment. We know that Jesus was more likely born around 4, what we would date as 4 BC. So if you really want to date your calendars from the time of Christ, it really, by the way, should be 2026. That really should be the date right now. We should be in the year of our Lord 2026. So our calendars are wrong. Jesus was likely born between 4 and 6 
BC. And that's why it kind of makes some sense that the star might have been the indication that Jesus was born. You know, again, those coming together of those planets. It might be, it might not be. I don't know if there is a physical explanation of it or it's a miraculous event. Either way, it doesn't matter. God used this to announce the coming of Jesus. So they came, verse 3, when King Herod heard this, ah, here's how we know this date must be between 4 and 6 BC. King Herod, Herod the Great, died in 4 BC. So there is no way possible that our calendars could be correct. We are at least four years to six years off on the dating of our calendars. So again, King Herod, Herod the Great, was a non-Jew, but he was appointed to rule the Jews. Apparently he had some family in his history that was Jewish, and he was appointed to rule here, but honestly he thought more like a Gentile, more like a Greek person. Really didn't care an awful lot, but he was a great king in terms of he established the pride again in Israel. He went on this great building project to win over all the Jews on his behalf. He started rebuilding the temple that we see later in the biblical stories about Jesus' life when he points to the uh, temple and so forth. He re rebuilt a lot of um, uh, community temples in Jerusalem, or not temples, uh, pardon me, buildings in, in Jerusalem. So he's on this massive building project to establish his name as a great king, okay? And so threatened was, uh, um, were, were the Romans who were ruling at this time by King Herod that when his sons, it came time for his sons to rule, they broke it into what we call three tetrarchs uh, so that no one of them would have the type of power that Herod had. Nevertheless, we know this kind of dates who Jesus was in his time frame. So around 4 B.C., uh, this event took place. So King Herod heard about this. He was frightened. <laughs> this is a funny thing. Listen to this. And all of Jerusalem with him. I don't think so. Well, they might have been threatened that had their news gotten out that there was a king being born in Bethlehem, that Rome was going to come down like a ton of bricks on top of Israel. So it might be true that they were afraid of an invasion by Rome. They already had at least some autonomy they didn't want to be under the thumb any more than what they were at this point. So, it is possible that everybody was frightened, but they weren't frightened for Herod. Herod was not a beloved figure, except, <laughs> except by some of the religious rulers, not the Pharisees. Pharisees opposed him, by the way. The Sadducees uh, were in support of him because they were, again, uh, liking the power that he brought to them as opposed to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the opposition party, okay? So King Herod heard this. He was frightened. All of Jerusalem with him. And he called together the chief priests, the scribes of the people, and he inquired of them, where was this Messiah to be born? Messiah, again, word Messiah. Let me throw this out. Messiah. Is a Hebrew word. That means the anointed one. Anointed by whom? Well, this would be by God. Appointed by God for a purpose. You're set aside for a purpose. And in this case, to rule Israel. All right? But we're going to learn something about this Messiah in just a moment. This is the same word, by the way. This is the Greek word. Christ is the exact same word. Like, it doesn't look like the same. Two different languages, okay? This is Hebrew. This is Greek. So when we call Jesus Christ, Christ was not Jesus' last name. There were no surnames back in those days, okay? Christ was the title, Messiah. So Jesus, Messiah, okay? But we're saying it in Greek because the New Testament was given to us in Greek, not in Hebrew. But nevertheless, the Messiah. So who was this anointed one going to be? And so the uh, chief priests, the scribes, again, uh, he brought together this coalition of, of scholars. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by a prophet, you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least of the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people, Israel. Um, Bethlehem was, again, a tiny, tiny town. Jerusalem was the big city. 
And again, not far out was Bethlehem. Bethlehem, the word Bethlehem itself means the house of bread. Okay. Again, this uh, dates back all the way to the time of King David. And, of course, he was fed here, the house of bread. Okay, the place of bread. So they, um, they began, Herod secretly called the wise men, again, those Persian advisors, and he asked for them uh, to the exact time when the star had appeared. And then he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for this child, and when you have found him, bring word to me, so I might pay him homage. He's lying, isn't he? Herod killed his own sons because he was threatened by their power and potentiality of taking away his throne from him. So what do you think he thought of this Jesus character, the Messiah? I don't think he wanted anything to do with Jesus. But you need to keep that in mind, because in just a moment we're going to see how different Jesus is compared to what the expectation of Herod was about who Jesus was. So again, when the, uh, uh, when the wise men heard this, they set out and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. And so when they saw the star where it stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. And on entering the house, <laughs> hold on a second, on entering the house, okay, how many of us send out Christmas cards with the shepherds and the wise men all gathered together around the manger where Jesus was born? Oh, I've sent up cards like that. What a crowded night it was. The wise men did not come on the same night in which Jesus was born. We don't know how old Jesus was. Now, I will point out to you again. Remember, our lesson for today doesn't say that they came to the manger to see Jesus. In the stable, they came to a house in which Jesus was residing by this point. How old was Jesus? Could have been a week old, could have been a month old, could have been upwards of, we'll say anywhere from two days, I'm just making that up, who knows, to two years of age. What? He could have been two years of age? Could have been. We don't know. He could have been a toddler crawling all over the place. Who knows how old he was, but he was somewhere older than a day or two. Younger than two years. Somewhere in there. He might have been a year old. Maybe a year and a half old. So we don't know how long it took these men to get to Jesus. Um, who knows? Uh, why do I say upwards of two years? Because we're not going to get to this part of the lesson today. Right after this lesson, Herod sends soldiers into Bethlehem to kill all the babies two years of age and younger. He wants to make sure he kills this baby Jesus. So that's why he couldn't have been older than two. He probably wasn't quite approaching two years of age. But Herod wanted to make sure he nailed every single one of them. So that star might have been up there for a while. Who knows how long it was there before these guys found their way to Bethlehem. All right, so let's go on. So they, on entering the house, the house again, not the manger, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They knelt down and paid a homage. They opened up their treasure chests and they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Ooh. Okay, this brings up a point of trivia. How many wise guys were there? I know the, the gut reaction is three. The Bible never says how many wise men there were. There could have been two. There could have been 30. Who knows? Again, 30, I don't know. There were more, there's more than one because it says wise men, plural, but it doesn't say. So we have a tradition that there are only three because of the three gifts they brought. But again, we don't know how many there were. Tradition assigns names to each one of those characters, but again, it's a tradition. It's not something we learned from the Bible. It was something that's added hundreds of years later in the tradition of the church. But
but we don't really know how many wise guys there were, okay? So they opened up their treasure chest and offered them these three gifts, again, that's where the tradition comes of three, even though we don't know, of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another route, another road. Okay, I find this really interesting. Uh, we need to learn, we talk to you about what the epiphany is. What's the aha moment here? And I would say there's a couple of aha moments here that we learn in the book of uh, Matthew chapter 2. The one is, these Persians, they've come to seek Jesus out. I find this interesting that the people who came to seek Jesus out were not Jews, were not religious leaders. These religious leaders of Jerusalem knew the biblical prophecies and believed that there was something going on, but none of them came to seek him out. Not one of them. It took these Persian wise men. What does that tell us? What's the aha moment? Jesus isn't just for the Jews. Jesus isn't just for Christians. Jesus has come for the entire world. Remember, these are Persians. These are not Christians. They're Jews. Of course, Christianity didn't exist at this point. It was being born, I guess, through Christ and his, ultimately his gift to the church and the creation of the church. But these were Persians. And yet, God revealed to them that something special was happening through this baby Jesus. So I would say my aha moment, first one, is you don't ever dismiss somebody just because they're not a Christian. Just because. <laughs> Iranians, I think it's lovely and a wonderful thing that the very first people who sought him out were people from Iran. So, you know, take all of those bigotries you have towards Muslims and stick it up your pipe and smoke it and get rid of it. Better yet, put it at the door. Because how dare we be in judgment of people who don't hold to all of our beliefs because that doesn't mean that God can't reveal to them his love. God is not bound by our theology, okay? Now, we do believe that obviously there's something special about this Jesus through whom the salvation of the world has come, but these folks acknowledge that. They recognize that. And so we need to leave our bigotries home towards people. So that's, that's one aha moment. The other thing, you notice the gifts that they brought to him. And I know in previous years I have taught about this. They brought gold. Well, gold is, is a tribute fit for a king. Wait a minute, who did they see? It's a baby Jesus. He's not surrounded in some beautiful palace. It's just a very humble house in Bethlehem outside the hustle and bustle of the big city of Jerusalem. But they acknowledged him as king by bringing this gift of gold to him. Now, I will tell you, that's also significant in another way, because just moments after this, of course, Herod sent soldiers to kill all the babies in Bethlehem. Or, pardon me. Yes, in Bethlehem. And, uh, and so the Holy Family escaped to Egypt. How in the world did they survive? They were a humble family. Well, God provided through the gifts of these wise men, gifts of gold that probably helped them survive in their escape to Egypt. But we're not done. So they gave gifts of gold, a, a, a gift worthy of a king, indication, indication that this baby, though he doesn't seem like very much, he wasn't born in powerful courts, has come to rule. So this Jesus defies, by the gift of gold, defies powers of this world. The powers of this world don't seek them out. The only people who came to seek them out were people who are now out of power. The true powers of Jerusalem, they didn't seek them out. They don't want, Herod doesn't want anything to do with him. He wants them dead because he seems to be a threat. But Jesus, this king, doesn't impose himself by power and by force. He defies the powers. He's a humble baby born to peasant parents in an insignificant city. 
He's not surrounded by the trappings of wealth and power. Jesus defies the powers of this world. We also are learned that he's, got, he's gotten a second gift. So gold, frankincense, okay? We'll just put Frank down. Frankincense, this is a type uh, of incense that is used in liturgical worship, in particular in Israel. And, and I'll be frank, where did this tradition come from using all this incense in the temple and so forth? It's because the priests and all the people gathered together stunk, all right? You can imagine, it's not like these people had baths on a regular basis. And so you have a gathering, all these people in the temple, and oh my gosh, the body odor must have been horrendous. And so one of the things they did to make it sweet smelling, to say, God, we want to offer a better sacrifice to you, they would use incense like frankincense, to make it a sweet-smelling space, despite our odor under our underarms, okay? Literally, this is true. This is where this tradition of using incense came from. We want to offer a sweet-smelling sacrifice to God. We don't want God to smell our body odor, all right? And so it's a tradition. But it also is something that was done by the priests. So who is Jesus? Jesus is the king who also came to be priest. Those two were never, ever combined. A king and a priest? A priestly king? What's a priest do? A priest is somebody who stands in the gap between us and God, who brings God close to humanity. Now, every priest before Jesus failed in their task of bringing God to us, or us to God. But Jesus is the one who who finally is able, once and for all, to bring God to humanity. Because after all, who is Jesus? Hmm. Let you think about that one. John 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay. So gold, frankincense, the kingly priest who... <laughs> See, now I can't even remember how it's Merce spelled. You guys are going to go ahead. You can get on me. I knew there's two R's in there. That's right. I couldn't remember two R's or two H's. Two R's. So Mer. Mer was a burial spice. What? Uh, okay. I, I don't know about that, but if somebody comes to you and you've got a brand new baby and they bring you a burial spice, for your baby as a gift, I think it, you'd probably smack him in the face, right? But it's indicative of this Jesus and what he came to do. Unlike the powerful rulers of the day, Herod, what did Herod want to do? What a contrast this is. Herod, so jealous of his power that he wants to kill anyone that gets in the way, including his own kids, including a defenseless baby boy. He will kill to maintain his power. What is Jesus willing to do? He's willing to die so that we might be reconciled to God. And that's the nature of his kingship for us. Whoa. Aha. This would change how we live our lives, how we think about God and our relationship with God. So I'm going to end with a little homily with this. I know this is a long Bible study. Thank you for hanging in there. What I'm thinking of is January 6, 2021. Okay, what happened on January 6, 2021? Epiphany Wednesday! Some people who were begrudging elections and administrations and whatever was going on, their political mindset decided that they were going to storm the castle in Washington, D.C., yeah, power, baby! What offends me about this is many of them did it in the name of Jesus Christ. Not all of them, but some did. And some defended this in the name of Jesus Christ. Where? Where do we see anywhere in the Bible that Jesus has come to establish power and might and storm the castle and overthrow governments? Nowhere. That's not the way of Jesus. Jesus isn't about power and about might. He is about ruling. He's about ruling our hearts. He's about overthrowing the true God in our lives, and that's ourselves. 
okay? But he does it with gentleness and kindness and with love, not by forcing himself on us with weapons of war, but by giving his life for us. Now that should be an aha moment. It should change the way we think about this world, but how we think about each other, but how we treat each other. If your view of this Jesus is, we need to establish a particular type of political uh, uh, recipe to make this world fit in with God's kingdom, well, you know what? You're barking up the wrong tree here, buddy. Jesus didn't come to establish political rule on this planet. <laughs> I guess in one sense, Jesus came to overthrow these things, sure, but overthrow them through peace and through love. Ah. So now how are you going to treat people? Are you going to retreat into your parochial political perspectives? Or are you going to reach out in love? Aha! Jesus has come to change our lives and how we treat each other. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, aha! I've learned something. Oh, I hope everybody at home is too. Jesus did not come to enforce his kingdom upon people. He didn't threaten us, bully us, use weapons of war. He didn't take a life. He gave his life. He is the kingly priest who gave his life for us. Thank you for this new way, God. May you touch and transform our hearts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Go in peace. And serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.